Polypropylene is the other main uh, homopolymer found in the polyolefin family, and we will expand on that. Uh, polypropylene, in terms of its structure, looks very similar to polyethylene, but instead of there being a hydrogen here, we have a methyl group. So this is propylene. Uh, this is typically done with ziegler natta polymerization or metallocene catalysis, uh, so not free radical, uh, and made into propylene, so uh, polypropylene. So propylene, polymerization, polypropylene. Pretty straightforward. This is the second most important member of the polyolefin family. It's the second most used thermoplastic in terms of tonnage. Polypropylene and polyethylene are very, very similar. Uh, it has a lot to do with their similarity in structure. Uh, but polypropylene's main difference, the main takeaway, uh, if, if someone is asking you on a quiz, say, is that polypropylene is used at higher temperatures than polyethylene. Here are some of the differences. Uh, for polyethylene, the Tg is negative 120. For polypropylene, that is that goes up to negative 20 Celsius. Uh, for polyethylene, the crystalline melting, melting temperature, which again affects your processing temperature, is 110 to 138, whereas for polypropylene, it's 165 to 175. Uh, density of polyethylene ranges very widely, um, whereas polypropylene is a little less dense, so it tends to be similar in density to low-density polyethylene. Uh, melt temperature for polyethylene can be as low as 110, polypropylene somewhere usually about 176. Uh, the surface temperature of polyethylene products is lower than polypropylene, it's softer and more flexible than polypropylene, and polyethylene is much more susceptible to environmental stress cracking than polyethylene. Uh, uh, when it comes to polypropylene, this is a harder, more rigid, and more brittle polymer compared to polyethylene, but it does have better resistance to environmental stress cracking. So here's kind of an uh, idea of consumption. Uh, polyethylene is used almost twice as much than polypropylene. Then we have our friends polyvinyl chloride and polystyrene. When it comes to polypropylene, a lot of the work that was done was done after 1954. Um, because of the uh, because polypropylene doesn't polymerize very well with traditional free radical polymerization, so when the uh, Ziegler Natta catalyst came online, polypropylene was began to be successful. Uh, the primarily uh, isotactic polypropylene uh, is what is produced commercially. Uh, it has similar manufacturing and uh, to high density polyethylene. So polypropylene is produced by the low pressure process that is similar to high-density polyethylene. Polypropylene is produced in linear chains, again, similar to high-density polyethylene, and it's very similar to manufacturing method as well. So a lot, a lot of similarities here. You'll hear that over and over again in this lecture, so that's kind of the takeaway. Uh, there were multiple generations for catalysis for polypropylene to make it successful, to make it efficient, to get really good uh, isotacticity uh, and low atactic fraction, and I'll explain that a little more in detail. Uh, first generation were Ziegler Natta, Natta catalysts. It was successful, but it got low yield, and the isotactic index was less than 85. Also, you had to remove the catalyst and the atactic fraction, so that caused a little bit of a problem. Second generation, you got higher yield, higher isotactic index, and you only had to worry about taking out the catalyst. Uh, and when the, thir the, solid, the third generation, uh, you got even greater isotactic index and no need for the catalyst removal. Um, then you started to get much better morphological and molecular weight control, uh, and then you got an improvement in overall quality in the 2000s. So again, we were still developing the catalysis uh, in the 2000s. Now, it's 2019. Uh, this probably seems like a lifetime ago to some of you who are listening to this. Uh, you know, to me, that was my uh, that was my going to the bar days was uh, the early 2000s. So um, this is a lot of advancements that are made. Uh, say that when I was in graduate school or things like that are things that are now commercially viable. So it happens very quickly in the plastics industry, and that's one thing I want to underline with these kind of history lessons. Uh, there are three manufacturing processes. You have a hydrocarbon slurry or suspension. Um, you use an inert diluent. It transfers propylene to the catalyst. It removes heat from the system. Uh, and then you can uh, deactivate and remove the catalyst, and it dissolves the atactic fraction. Uh, this really isn't used very much anymore. Um, then you often have the bulk or bulk slurry. This uses liquid polypropylene instead of uh, liquid inert hydrocarbon. The polymer doesn't dissolve into the diluent, but it sits on top of it. And then um, the polymer can be basically pulled off, and then the unreacted monomer can be flashed off uh, because it's a, it's a gas. Um, and then there's the gas phase. Uh, this is gaseous polypropylene in contact with a solid catalyst. And this uses a fluidized bed type system. 
Um, a fluidized bed is really interesting. Hopefully my video works here, so I'm going to give this a shot. So this is an example of fluidized bed. Um, there. So they're putting in some small glass beads, real small particle size, uh, and understandably these are solid, but if you start putting air or gas through it, now this is probably uh, compressed air. Um, in the case of uh, pro polypropylene synthesis, you would be putting propylene gas through this. So they're sticking a pen in there. Now they it acts like a solid. You start putting liquid through it, and it starts to behave like liquid. So that's why it's fluidized. This bed of um, solid is fluidized by the gas moving through it, and that is how this is used. Uh, the spherical process is also used with all polypropylene types. It's kind of a schematic of that. Uh, again, this is your catalyst system, so this uses the tickles. Polypropylene is processed all of the ways that polyethylene is processed. Uh, extrusion, molding, all sorts of things. Um, it is also melt blown and spun bound into fibers. Typically injection molding is the most common shaping technique. Uh, blow molding and injection stretch molding are also used. There's a wide variety of end applications because of the ability to tailor properties. You can add anti-static additives uh, to reduce dust and dirt, uh, physical finishing, which is possible, um, either through, say, like uh, plasma flame or machining. And then uh, you can uh, uh, enhance surfaces to put printing inks and other things like that on top to decorate it. Also, you can by actually orient polypropylene into uh, uh, BOPP, by actually oriented polypropylene. So uh, you ex extrude and stretch the polypropylene in two ways, so in the machine direction, so parallel to the way it's coming out of the machine, and then the cross direction, so uh, in per perpendicular. And when you do this, you increase both the strength and the clarity. When you do that, you make very small crystal lights uh, that enhance the strength, but those crystal lights are small enough that you don't create cloudiness. And this is good for snack foods, uh, fresh produce, and confectionery. Also, it creates something that's easy to coat, easy to print, and easy to laminate. Uh, a lot of the polyolefins have a very waxy surface, and so you have to post-process them to get to be able to decorate things. So uh, the biaxley orient orientation helps in that uh, coating or printing. Now I promised I was going to talk about tasticity, uh, and here is where I will do that. Tasticity is the arrangement of monomers by the physical configuration of pendant groups. Now in polyethylene we had four little hydrogens sticking off of it, none of them were different. In polypropylene we have a methyl group, and that's this has specific tasticity. So I talked about this a little bit um, when we were talking about crystallinity, but I'm going to revisit this. So atactic materials have no particular order, syndiotactic materials have pendant groups on alternating sides of the chain, and isotactic have pendant groups on one side of the chain. So isotactic versus syndiotactic. So when we're talking about polypropylene, we have this methyl group. And with isotactic polypropylene, you have all of these methyl groups on one side of the chain. One side is all hydrogens, then you have methyl, hydrogen, methyl, hydrogen. Uh, all again, all on one side of the polymer chain. And commercial polypropylene, this is an advantageous thing. So 90 to 95 percent of commercial polypropylene is isotactic. And that's why they use this, the uh, catalyst they use. Syndiotactic has alternating sides of the chain. So here we, we're here, all the methyl groups are on one side, here they alternate. Methyl, 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 methyl. And then isotactic, uh, maybe it's here, maybe it's there, no particular prediction of where that methyl group will be based on the methyl group before it. Polypropylene has a wide variety of advantages. It is low cost, like its polyethylene cousin, excellent flexural strength, good impact strength, uh, you can process it any way you can process a thermoplastic. Low coefficient of friction, excellent electrical insulating properties, good fatigue resistance, excellent moisture resistance, a service temperature up to 126 Celsius, and very good chemical resistance. Uh, it has the disadvantages, though, of UV degradation and poor weathering. Uh, it also does high thermal expansion, which also enhances the uh, permeability, which reduces the weathering. 
Uh, this is subject to attack by chlorinated solvents and aromatics. It is somewhat difficult to, to bond or paint. Uh, this is not good for solvent welding. Uh, it does oxidize readily and it is flammable. Um, I will start to talk about the things that are not flammable that are self-extinguishing. Uh, but until I do, you can assume that basically, once this stuff is in the melt, it acts like an accelerant. You know, like its cousin, gasoline. So here are the mechanical properties of polypropylene compared to low density and high density. Uh, this does tend to be lower density than even low density polyethylene. Its crystallinity tends to be similar to low density polyethylene. Uh, the molecular weight tends to be um, more similar to high density polyethylene. You can make wide ranges of molecular weights depending on processing. Uh, tensile strength tends to be a little higher than polyethylene. Uh, same thing with modulus. Uh, elongation is similar. It has uh, a little worse in terms of the impact properties. It's a little more brittle. Very similar in terms of its optical properties. Its melt temperature is much higher. Its PG is much higher, and that is the big thing. Uh, it's similar in water absorption. This also doesn't need to be dried prior to uh, processing. Uh, it is not real good in terms of its oxidation resistance, not good in terms of its uh, UV resistance. Uh, tends to be solvent and alkali resistant. Um, again, oxidizing acids pose a problem for it, just like low density and, poly and high density polyethylene. Very, very similar in terms of its properties, with the exception of temperature. So, once again, takeaway is temperature. Uh, this is made by a wide variety of companies. Uh, the, the ones that kind of have the uh, catalysis uh, technology tend to be the ones that make the most uh, polypropylene. So Montel, BASF, Amico, uh, the ones that uh, have the market cornered on the catalysis have the ones that also make the polypropylene. There are a wide variety of uh, uh, copolymers for polypropylene. Ethylene uh, propylene copolymers are the biggie. So small amounts of polypropylene can reduce uh, crystallinity of linear high density polyethylene. So you want something that's linear chains but uh, reduces the crystallinity. A little bit of polypropylene can do that. Uh, they also make polyalamers or block copolymers, uh, blocks of polyethylene and then bo blocks of polypropylene. Uh, still allows for crystallization, but what it does is it, it creates something that is similar to a blend of polyethylene and polypropylene without it phase separating. So it's in the same molecule, so it can't phase separate, but it gives uh, similar properties to um, a, a blend. And what that would do is give you higher temperature properties. You can also make ethylene propylene rubbers. Now remember, it's the crystallinity in ethylene or propylene that causes it to not be rubbery at room temperature. If you can randomly copolymerize ethylene and propylene, this prevents crystallization, uh, but still gives you the low temperature property. So it actually is rubbery um, at room temperature. Uh, so they have a low TG, so similar to that of polyethylene, anywhere between negative 110, negative 20, depending on the ratios of polyethylene and polypropylene, but this produces a rubbery polymer at room temperature, whereas polyethylene by itself or polypropylene by itself would not be rubbery at room temperature. Um, and this allows to have a thermoplastic rubber or thermoplastic elastomer, whereas conventional vulca vulcanization uh, are not uh, thermoplastic they are thermosetting, so they cross-link and you can't melt them and reprocess them, but this gives you a thermoplastic rubber. So this is where I'm going to conclude for the uh, polypropylene lecture. We'll pick up the second half in a moment.